Chapter Two of Trail of the Hawk. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Mike Vendetti, MikeVendetti.com. Trail of the Hawk by Sinclair Lewis. Chapter Two. From the creek they tramped nearly two miles through the dark gravel banks of the railway, cutting across the high trestle over Jor Lemon River, where Gertie had to be coaxed from stringer to stringer. They stopped only when a gopher in a clearing demanded attention. Gertie finally forgot the superiority of age when she saw Carl whistle the quivering gopher cry, while the gopher sat as though hypnotized on his pile of fresh black earth. Carl stalked him. As always happened, the gopher popped into his hole just before Carl reached him. But it certainly did seem that he had nearly been caught, and Gertie was jumping with excitement when Carl returned, strutting, cocking his saber-stick over his shoulder. Gertie was tired. She, the Minneapolis girl, had not been much awed by the railway ties nor the arch, but now she tramped proudly beside the man who could catch gophers, till Carl inquired, "'Are you getting awful hungry? It's almost supper-time.' "'Yes, I'm hungry, trustingly. I'm going to go swipe some taters. I guess it may be there's a farmhouse over there. I see a chimney beyond the slaw. You stay here. I doesn't stay alone. I'd better go home. I'm scared. Come on. I won't let nothing hurt you. They circled a swamp surrounded by woods, Carl's left arm about her, his right clutching the saber. Though the sunset was magnificent, and a gay company of blackbirds swayed in the reeds of the slough, dusk was sneaking out from the underbrush that blurred the forest floor, and Gertie caught the panic fear. She wished to go home at once. She saw darkness reaching for them. Her mother would unquestionably whip her for staying out so late. She discovered a mud smear on the side of her skirt, and a shoe button was gone. She was cold. Finally. If she missed supper at home, she would get no tea biscuits and honey. Gertie's polite little stomach knew its rights and insisted upon them. I wish I hadn't come, she lamented. I wish I hadn't. Do you suppose Mama will be dreadfully angry? Won't you explain to her? You will, won't you? It was Carl's duty as officer commanding to watch the blackened stumps that sprang from the underbrush, and there was something way over in the woods, beyond the trees, horribly gashed to whiteness by lightning. Perhaps the something hadn't moved. Perhaps it was a stump. But he answered her loudly, so that lurking robbers might overhear. I know a great big man over there, and he's a friend of mine. He's a brakey on the M&D, and he lets me ride in the cab any time I want to, and he's right behind us. I was just making believe, Gertie. I'll explain everything to your mother. He's bigger than anybody. More conversationally. Ah, oh, Jiminy, Gertie, don't cry. Please don't. I'll take care of you. And if you ain't going to have any supper, we'll swipe some taters and roast them. He gulped. He hated to give up to return to woodshed and chicken yard. But he conceded. Yes, maybe we hadn't better go seek our fortunes. No more to... A long wail tore through the air. The children shrieked together and fled, stumbling in dry bog, weeping in terror. Carl's backbone was all one prickly bar of ice. But he waved his stick fiercely, and because he had to care for her, was calm enough to realize that the wail must have been the cry of a bittern. It wasn't nothing but a bird, Gertie. Can't hurt us. Hurt him lots of times. Nevertheless, he was still trembling when they reached the edge of the farmyard clearing beyond the swamp. It was gray-dark. They could see only the mass of a barn and a farmer's cabin, both new to Carl. Holding her hand, he whispered, "'They must be some taters, beggars in the barn. I'll sneak in and see. You stand here by the corn-crib and work out some ears between the bars. See, like this?' He left her. The sound of her frightened snivel aged him. He tiptoed to the barn door, eyeing a light in the farmhouse. He reached far up to the latch of the broad door and pulled out the wooden pin. The latch slipped noisily from its staple. The door opened with a groaning creak and banged against the barn. 
Paralyzed, hearing all the silence of the wild clearing, he waited. There was a step in the house. The door opened. A huge farmer, tousle-haired, black-bearded, held up a lamp and peered out. It was the Black Dutchman. The Black Dutchman was a living legend. He often got drunk and rode past Carl's home at night, lashing his horses and cursing in German. He had once thrashed the schoolteacher for whipping his son. He had no friends. "'Oh, dear, oh, dear, I wished I was home,' sobbed Carl. But he started to run to Gertie's protection. The black Dutchman set down the lamp. "'Where is the "'I see you. Damnation!' he roared and lumbered out, seizing a pitchfork from the manure pile. Carl galloped up to Gertie, panting. "'He's after us!' and dragged her into the hazel bushes beyond the corn crib. As his country-bred feet found and followed a path toward deeper woods, he heard the black Dutchman beating the bushes with his pitchfork, shouting, "'I think I know where you are, huh?' Carl jerked his companion forward till he lost the path. There was no light. They could only crawl on through the bushes, whose malicious fingers stung Gertie's face and plucked at her proud frills. He lifted her over fallen trees, freed her from branches, and all the time between his own sobs he encouraged her and tried to pretend that their incredible plight was not the end of the world, whimpering, "'We're almost on the road now, Gertie. Honest, we are. I can't hear him now. I ain't afraid of him. He wouldn't dast hurt us. My pa would fix him.' "'Oh, I hear him. He's coming. Oh, please save me, Carl. Gee, run fast. I don't hear him. I ain't afraid of him.' They burst out on a grassy woodland road and lay down panting. They could see a strip of stars overhead, and the world was dark, silent, in the inscrutable night of autumn. Carl said nothing. He tried to make out where they were, where this road would take them. It might run deeper into the woods, which he did not know as he did the arch environs, and he had so twisted through the bush that he could not tell in what direction lay either the main wagon road or the M and D track. He lifted her up, and they plodded hand in hand, till she said, oh, I'm awful tired. It's awful cold. My feet hurt awfully. Carl, dear, oh, please take me home now. I want my mama. Maybe she won't whip me now. It's so dark and old, she muttered incoherently. There, by the road. He's waiting for us. She sank down, her arm over her face, groaning. Don't hurt me. Carl straddled before her on guard. There was a distorted mass crouched by the road just ahead. He tingled with the chill of fear down through his thighs. He had lost his stick saber, but he bent, felt for, and found another stick, and piped to the shadowy watcher. I ain't afraid of you. You going away from here. The watcher did not answer. I know you are. Bellowing with fear, Carl ran forward futurelessly waving his stick and clamoring, "'You better not touch me!' The stick came down with a silly flat click upon the watcher, a roadside boulder. "'It's just a rock, Gertie. Jiminy, I'm glad it's just a rock. Uh, I knew it was a rock all the time. Ben Russ gets scared every time he sees a stump in the woods, and he always thinks it's a robber.' Chattily, Carl went back, lifted her again, endured her kissing his cheek, and they started on. I'm so cold, Gertie moaned from time to time till he offered. I'm trying to build a fire. Maybe we'd better camp. I got a match that I swiped from the kitchen. May I make a fire so we can better camp? I don't want to camp. I want to go home. I don't know where we are. I told you. Can you make a regular campfire like Indians? Hmm? That's. But I'd rather go home. You ain't scared now, are you, Gertie? Gee, you're an awful brave girl. No, but I'm cold, and I wish we had some tea biscuits. Ever too complacent was Miss Gertrude Cowles, the good girl, in whatever group she joined. But she seemed to trust in Carl's heroism, and as she murmured of a certain chilliness, she seemed to take it for granted that he would immediately bring her some warmth. Carl had never heard of the romantic males who, in fiction, so frequently offer their coats to ladies, fair but chill. Yet he stripped off his jacket and wrapped it about her, while his gingham-clad shoulders twitched with cold. "'I can hear a crick. 
way, way over there. Let's camp by it, he decided. They scrambled through the bush, Carl leading her and feeling the way. He found a patch of long grass beside the creek. With only his tremulous hands for eyes, he gathered leaves, twigs, and dead branches, and piled them together in a pyramid, as he had been taught to do by the older woods-faring boys. It was still no wind, but Carl, who had gobbled up every word he had heard about deer-hunting in the north woods, got a great deal of interesting fear out of dreading what might happen if his one match did not light. He made Gertrude kneel beside him with the jacket outspread, and he hesitated several times before he scratched the match. It flared up. The leaves caught. The pile of twigs was instantly aflame. He wept. Jiminy, if it hadn't lighted. By and by, he announced loudly, I wasn't afraid, to convince himself and sat up throwing twigs on the fire grandly. Gertie, who didn't really appreciate heroism, sighed. I'm hungry, and... My second-grade teacher told us a story how there was an Arctic explorer, and he was out in a blizzard. And I wish we had some tea biscuits, concluded Gertie, companionably but firmly. I'll go pick some hazelnuts. He left her feeding the flame. As he crept away, the fire behind him, he was dreadfully frightened, now that he had no one to protect. A few yards from the fire, he stopped in terror. He clutched a branch so tightly that it creased his palm. Two hundred yards away, across the creek, was a small square of a lighted window, hovering detached in the darkness. For a panic-filled second, Carl was sure that it must be the Black Dutchman's window. His tired child mind whined, but there was no creek near the Black Dutchman's. Though he did not want to venture up to the unknown light, he growled, "'I will if I want to,' and limped forward. He had to cross the creek, a strange creek whose stepping stones he did not know. Shivering, hesitant, he stripped off his shoes and stockings and dabbled the edge of the water with reluctant toes to see if it was cold. It was. Dog gone! he swore mightily. He plunged in and waded across. He found a rock and held it ready to throw at the dog that was certain to come snapping at him as he tiptoed through the clearing. His wet legs smarted with cold. The fact that he was trespassing made him feel more forlornly lost than ever. But he stumbled up to the one-room shack that was now shaping itself against the sky. It was a house that he believed he had never seen before. When he reached it, he stood for fully a minute, afraid to move. But from across the creek whimpered Gertie's call. Oh! Oh, Carl, where are you? He had to hurry. He crept along the side of the shack to the window. It was too high in the wall for him to peer through. He felt for something to stand upon and found a short board, which he wedged against the side of the shack. He looked through the dusty window for a second. He sprang from the board. Alone in the shack was the one person about Jeroboam, more feared, more fabulous than the Black Dutchman. Bone Stillman, the man who didn't believe in God. Bone Stillman read Robert G. Ingersoll and said what he thought. Otherwise, he was not dangerous to the public peace. A lone old bachelor farmer. It was said that he had been a sailor or a policeman, a college professor or a priest, a forger or an embezzler. Nothing positive was known except that three years ago he had appeared and bought this farm. He was a grizzled man of fifty-five with a long, tobacco-stained gray mustache and an open-necked blue flannel shirt. To Carl, beside the shack, Bone Stillman, was all that was demonic. Gertie was calling again. Carl climbed up his board and resumed his inspection, seeking a course of action. The one-room shack was lined with tar paper on which were pinned lithographs of Robert G. Ingersoll, Karl Marx, and Napoleon. Under a gun rack made of deer antlers was a cupboard half filled with dingy books, shotgun shells, fishing tackle. Bone was reading by a pine table still littered with supper dishes. Before him lay a clean-limbed English setter. The dog was asleep. In the shack was absolute stillness and loneliness intimidating. 
While Carl watched, Bone dropped his book and said, "'Here, Bob, what do you think of single tax, eh?' Carl gazed apprehensively. No one but Bone was in the shack. It was said that the devil himself sometimes visited there. On Carl was the chill of a nightmare. The dog raised his head, stirred, blinked, pounded his tail on the floor, and rose. A gentlemanly, affable chap to lay his muzzle on Bone's knee, while a solitary droned. "'This fellow says in this book here that the city's the natural place to live. Aboriginal tribes prove man's naturally gregarious. Why think about it, eh? Bob? Run country this is. No thinking. What in the name of seven saintly sisters did I ever want to be a farmer for, eh? Let's skedaddle, Bob. I ain't an atheist. I'm an agnostic. Lonely, Bob? Go over and talk to his whiskers. Karl Marx. He's liberal. He don't care what you say. He... Ah, oh, shut up. You're damn poor company. Say something. Carl, still motionless, was the more agonized because there was no sound from Gertie. Not even a sobbing call. Anything might have happened to her. While he was coaxing himself to knock on the pane, Stillman puttered about the shack, petting the dog, filling his pipe. He passed out of Carl's range of vision towards the side of the room in which was the window. A huge hand jerked the window open and caught Carl by the hair. Two wild faces stared at each other, six inches apart. "'I saw you. Come here to plague me?' roared Bone Stillman. "'Oh, mister, oh, please, mister, it wasn't me and Gertie's lost in the woods. We, ouch, oh, please let me go.' "'Why, you're just a brat. Come here.' The lean arm of Bone Stillman dragged Carl through the window by the slack of his gingham shirt. "'Lost, eh? Where's the other one, Gertie, was it?' "'He's over in the woods.' "'Poor little tyke. Wait till I light my lantern.' The swinging lantern made friendly, ever-changing circles of light, and Carl no longer feared the dangerous territory of the yard. Riding piggyback on Bone Stillman, he looked down contentedly at the dog's deferential tail beside them. They found Gertie asleep by the fire. She scarcely awoke as Stillman picked her up and carried her back to his shack. She nestled her downy hair beneath his chin and closed her eyes. Stillman said cheerily as he ushered them into his mansion, "'I'll hitch up and take you back to town, you young tropical tramps. First you better have a bite to eat, though. What do kids eat?' dog was nuzzling Carl's hand, and Carl had almost forgotten his fear that the devil might appear. He was flatteringly friendly in his answer. Porridge and meat and potatoes. Only I don't like potatoes. And pie. Afraid I haven't any pie, but how'd some bacon and eggs go? As he stoked up his cannonball stove and sliced the bacon, Stillman continued to the children who were shyly perched on the buffalo robe cover of his bed. Were you scared in the woods? Yes, sir. Don't ever, for to blast that egg, don't forget this, son. Nothing outside of you can ever hurt you. It can chew up your toes, but it can't reach you. Nobody but you can hurt you. Let me try to make that clear, old man, if I can. There's your father. Draw up and set to. Pretty sleepy, are you? I'll tell you a story. Would you like to hear about how Napoleon smashed the theory of divine rule, or about how me and Charlie Weems explored Tiburon? Well, though Carl afterward remembered not one word of what Bone Stillman said, it is possible that the outcast treatment of him as a grown-up friend was one of the most powerful of the intangible influences which were to push him toward the great world outside of Jerusalem. The school-bound child, taught by young ladies that the worst immorality was whispering in school, the chief virtue, a dull quietude, was here first given to a reasonable basis for supposing that he was not always to be a backyard boy. The man in the flannel shirt, who chewed tobacco, 
who wrenched infinitives apart and thrust profane words between, was for fifteen minutes Carl's Florbell and Montessori. Carl's recollection of listening to bone burrs and to one of being somewhere in the back of a wagon beside Gertie, wrapped in buffalo robes, and of being awakened by the stopping of the wagon when Bone called to a band of men with lanterns who were searching for the missing Gertie. Apparently the next second he was being lifted out before his home, and his apron mother was kissing him and sobbing, "'Oh, my boy!' He snuggled his head on her shoulder and said, "'I'm cold, but I'm going to San Francisco.'" End of chapter 2